given time, I'm going to focus on only one thing, although there were many things I wanted to comment on. Um, and Richard brought up the uh, point about whether there should be one standalone goal or many standalone goals or, or goals on inequality. And I think that's such an important point, I wanted to focus on that. Um, the first is that those people who are primarily talking about income inequality keep using the word I inequality mm. as though it means income inequality, and you have to stop mm. doing that. Yes. Um, <laughs> the, the, the second is that gender inequality is not just a barrier um, to social inclusion and poverty reduction. It's a form of social organisation, just in the same way as income distribution is, and it has to be treated in the same way, not as a barrier to other things. The third is that women aren't a group. Um, if, you, if you constitute over 50% of the population, can you be a group? And the word group, again, is misleading. Um, gender is a way of organising society. It is not about a group of disadvantaged people um, in, in the way that the term group suggests. Um, and the fourth, and, and perhaps one most important point, is that there is already a goal, MDG3, on inequality. If we lose the existing goal on gender inequality and women's empowerment, that is going to send a very clear signal to the very large and powerful groups in the world who wish us to backtrack on the small amount of commitment that has been made so far on gender inequality. And so this is a heartfelt plea not to backtrack but to move forward, which requires at the very least a continuation of a standalone goal on women's empowerment. Thank you. We'll just pass the mic a couple of... Uh, Rob Page from the International Development Committee. As a quick question for Alex um, on the question of the genie and the palma. One of the most obvious things to say about the genie is that um, countries such as the US and ourselves and other Western countries don't necessarily score particularly well. I have no proper sense of how... Um, countries like that would look on the Palma and how that would compare. So I suppose my question is, is there a significant difference between the genie and the Palma in terms of how um, rich, developed nations um, score? And if so, does that difference um, have any implications in terms of how likely the Palma is to become more accepted and become more widely used? Thank you. I've got one um, question here that's come um, over the internet from Elisa Peter from the Elders Foundation, senior policy officer there. She says, um, some economists argue that I increased, increased inequality is a normal stage for countries to go through in their economic development process. What do the panel members think of this? Add that into the mix. Right now I saw... I <laughs> But let me ask Sheila and Isabel. We've got a lot of ODI people who want to speak, but I'm going to... I'm no. <laughs> Sheila and then Isabel, and then I might cut it off there. Uh, thank you, Sheila Page, unfortunately, ODI. Uh, I really would like to get this a little more political. I mean, the effort for the first set of MDGs was to find goals that at least looked, although we could all see underneath the appearance, technical, not political. If we're going to introduce inequality, there's no question that that is political. I just, uh, Kevin started by saying that we, th there are limits to acceptable inequalities. Those of us in this room and on these screens may well believe that. That's certainly not true of everyone who's going to be choosing the next set of MDGs. Therefore, if we, we need to make a decision of how far we are going to go for consensus and how far we're going to go for focus and accept that not everyone is going to want to be in that group. Mm. And that really think that that's something which hasn't been tackled by any of the speakers, that I'd like them to do so. And a very specific question to Alex, why ratios? I, mean, I think it's much more interesting to know that something happened to the middle in Mexico as well as to the top and the bottom than to have a ratio which doesn't tell me that. I mean, most of us are able to hold three numbers in our head at once. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Isabel Cardinal from DFID. Um, thank you. It's a brilliant meeting. Um, I think there's a big agreement that th around the fact that goals and targets need to better incentivize reaching marginalized people and the poor. And, you know, thanks to lots of the work by ODI and the consultation, it would be good going forward to hear more ideas in response to what the UK has focused on a lot on the high level panel 
which is addressing the causes through specific goals on governance, on including people more in open economies and on more justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm really sorry. There are other people that want to speak, but I'm going to cut in the interest of everyone getting out of this building before the afternoon is over. Um, I'm going to stop there and ask the panel. Don't feel you have to respond to every question. There are some questions that were directed at particular people. And also, clearly, I think the thing that the question seems to me that a lot of this we're asking is much more about the politics <laughs> and the tactics of this um, than the analysis. So perhaps if we if we focus there on the sort of politics, what is it that a post-2015 agreement can achieve in this area and what can't it do? Where, where would it be overreaching? Um, let's go back to the order that we started. Ask Kevin to kick off um, with, with any um, thoughts you've got on what you've heard. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. And uh, thanks to the other panelists. So really great presentations and for the questions. Uh, some, some quite tough questions, and I couldn't hear all of them. That may be selective hearing on my part, if they were critical. Um, um, look, I, I think on the politics, Claire, my take on this is that we need to be careful of two things. One is overloading the MDG agenda and using the MDG agenda as a sort of focal point for all of the concerns we have about social justice and, and, and distribution because that clearly will lead us towards stalemate. The other thing that we need to avoid is under ambition. And in, its, in order to preempt that second concern, that I, I, do think we, uh, that I do think inequality has to be at the heart of the agenda. I, I very much take Sheila's point, but I think on the other side, um, most people I think do understand the importance of equal opportunity. You know, the idea that every child should have an equivalent and equal right to education, an equal and equivalent right to survival. And I think if there's evidence also that inequalities are holding back progress to the shared goals on poverty, then, then the reduction of inequality has to be part of the agenda. Now, I, I think it's clearly the case that a lot of governments aren't going to like this. Um, and actually, I, I remember when I was working with Ricardo at the Human Development Report, we actually had a recommendation, I think it was in the 2005 report, that governments should be required to report on their progress in reducing disparities. And I, th I think I'm right in saying that year we broke the record for complaints from member state governments to the Human <laughs> Development Report office. So you know, this is not what governments like to report on. Governments like to report on averages, um, and they love to adopt long-term development goals. And 2030 is perfect timing for most governments, because it means they can treat the goals as absolutely irrelevant to any policies that they may actually be thinking about. And I think you know, we, we also, you know, the reason that we need to focus so strongly on this issue, for reasons the other panelists have set out, you know, there's an irony here. When redistribution goes from the bottom up, it's not somehow politically controversial for governments. When you start talking about redistribution of opportunity in the other direction, it all of a sudden you get this language about it, you know, interfering in the domestic priorities of member states, you know, the UN getting into areas it shouldn't get into, and, and this sort of thing. And I and, and I think you know we have to have enough ambition and confidence in our cause to to avoid that. Um, Claire, if, if I may, I'm not sure if I'm allowed as incoming director to do a bit of advocacy. Um, <laughs> but I, I, do want, I do want to advocate for an approach that I think addresses some of the concerns that have been raised, but could help to bring things together. And we've sort of framed this idea around stepping, what I call equity stepping stones. And the idea of an equity stepping stone is that, yes, you adopt a bold, absolute target for 2030. And I think the target, you know, it shouldn't be 125 a day. It should be $2.50 a day eradication by 2030. But you then set interim equity targets for each of the goals that accelerate progress. So, you know, for example, if you do adopt this target for ending all avoidable child deaths by 2030, what about the 2020 target that says we will, by 2020, halve the mortality gap between the richest and the poorest. 
you know, we will halve the school attendance gap between the richest and the poorest, or between the best performing and the worst performing part of a country. Now, you know, I, I think these are goals that are within the framework that governments have set out. You know, they're, they're within an absolute framework, but they help us to focus attention on, on what really matters. The, the final point I'd make on this is that I think as a research community, we really need to get serious about developing the tools that we need to monitor progress on the equity goals, because I think currently um, we just don't have them. And I think the work that Alex and Andy is doing on the, uh, on the Palmer is great. But you know, even on the Palmer, I mean, to, to be honest, we all know we don't have the faintest idea of what the real income of the top 10% in any society is because of under-reporting in the top one, one or two percent. So, you know, I, I think we need to develop a set of tools that are much more closely harnessed to what we're trying to achieve. And actually, you know, I, I think we could start setting out that, you know, if we ask governments to report goal by goal on equity targets, what are the metrics? Like, you know, could we produce some draft indicators that we actually run the numbers on individual countries that would give us some sort of idea of what would be involved for government ministries and what the sort of potential results might be. So uh, I'll leave you there, Claire. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Alex, there were a few very specific questions to you on the Palmer. Um, some of them you might want to take up in a more detailed way with individuals later. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I hear you. Um, OK. Uh, Yes, all right, three on the Palmer and one not. I'll start with the one that wasn't, which was uh, Duncan's. What do we do beyond tax about this? Of course, the answer to that, Duncan, is tax. <laughs> um, uh, no, look, there's, just, there's no question that the accountability of governments around the tax to GDP and the progressiveness of tax um, is, you know, is a joke compared to what it needs to be for us to make progress in this area. I'm not willing to say that because we agree on these arguments, you know, we should go and focus on the other stuff. We're nowhere near making the kind of progress we need. We're not even going in the right direction in far too many countries, um, either in terms of tax to GDP yeah. or... Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Better? Yeah. Okay, we're going in the wrong direction, both in terms of tax to GDP in a lot of countries and uh, the ratio of direct to indirect tax um, in a great many others um, as a just basic measure of progressiveness there. And any more detailed measures, it looks, um, uh, looks worse where you've got the data with, with some exceptions in Latin America. Um, okay, three questions on the Gini. Uh, Emma, looking at non-income uh, uses of the, of the Palmer, I should say. Uh, yes, we kind of started a bit of work using um, household surveys, uh, and it's kind of very interesting. You know, using, uh, firstly using the wealth index to create um, a Palmer on that, and then thinking about what the Palmer looks like in um, areas like mortality. There's a lot of work to do there, and the data's not perfect, as you know, um, but I think there are some interesting things coming out of that, one of which is just to confirm the idea that you can't have one or two summary measures, you need a whole range to capture the differences. But also, I have to say, the, the Palmer ratio looks like being um, in the areas we've looked at, kind of the leader in terms of the one that's most well correlated with overall progress. So if you were to prioritise, the Palmer looks like a good place to, uh, to begin. Um, uh, Sheila, why, why a ratio? Uh, yes, we can hold three numbers in our head, that's a fair point. Um, but look, the, the Mexico example I showed is an absolute outlier in terms of how much the middle moves. Um, uh, Mexico's middle share in 1990 is not replicated by anybody else uh, in any time period. So um, the stability of the 15 cent allows you to look away from that for focus. I think my thinking about this is that you can imagine somebody, uh, you know, a policymaker feeling under pressure to respond to a question about why that ratio has gone from perhaps three to four in a way that you can't with any other single measure I can think of. And imagining somebody, even a magnificent advocate as there are in the room, framing a question that involves those three numbers and how they've moved and hoping to get an answer uh, in a, an advocacy situation, I'm not sure. So I think simplicity, although you lose something, has, has advocacy advantages for the, for the politics. Uh, finally, Rob's question on what the Palmer looks like in rich countries um, and where their targets would be acceptable. Uh, it happens, and this is not deliberately by construction, that at least for some countries that might be particularly resistant to this agenda, um, like the one that we're in, the Palmer actually doesn't look too bad. 
um, and the extent of progress uh, due, due to tax and transfers is, is quite striking, um, much more so in, in uh, arguably than it is when you look at the difference in the, in the genies across stages of income. So uh, absolutely not a design element, but it may make it more politically uh, acceptable. Thank you. Um, we've heard quite a lot of pleas for uh, um, kind of specificity. Claire, I'm, I'm really sorry. Claire, I'm really sorry. Uh, could I just interrupt saying I, I have to leave? Um, so I'm actually going to a meeting at the World Bank on the post-2015 development goals. <laughs> it never stops. So, um, could, so if you could excuse me, and then thanks to everyone again for, uh, for, for the, the opportunity to, to be there with you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, okay, very quickly, um, so we heard a lot about sort of pleas for specificity. What I'd like to ask from the other um, from the from the the other panelists is just what would be your top two things that we should put in a post twenty fifteen agenda that would solve the problems that you've raised or would contribute be a, a push in the right direction that in so far as a post twenty fifteen agenda can help with any of this. Um, for the issues that the particular issues that you've raised and the things that you've heard from the from the questions, Marion, do you want to start? Oh, okay. That was a bit unfair. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think for us, for um, uh, ADD, for Site Savers and LPage, we really want to see two uh, key asks in the post 2015. The first one is obviously data disaggregation. We need more data on people with disability and older people to make them uh, visible. So data disaggregated by age, by gender, by ethnicity, and by disability. That's uh, a one of the requirement. And um, the other one is actually to have uh, human rights as like an overarching uh, goal, if you want, or overarching theme where um, um, countries going to have to actually, uh, you know, be made accountable for. So that's, 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 that's what we would like to see. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say things that will not be in the agenda, but I think uh, responding to, to what, uh, what needs to be done is, say, a, a serious discussion of the state tax. You know, the re the, I mean, uh, uh, if, if we're serious about merit and the quality of opportunity, we need to seriously discuss the state tax, and, and, and no one really wants to discuss that. And the other thing is something that Richard mentioned, uh, uh, something that Richard mentioned, that, that often we, we don't uh, relate to, to these kind of conversations on inequality is early early childhood intervention because that's that's where the the some of the the, the big uh, gaps uh, start and i think the save the children when alex was there produced this, this very good report on, on inequalities in in early childhood and and that's something so you see nutrition no one pays attention to nutrition and uh, and and we know that there is evidence that uh, under nutrition stunting underweight has a long-term impact on on child development and that's something it, it in it's very cheap also to 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 solve so thank you well i certainly would like to see a standalone goal on gender that takes the issue of violence against women very seriously <coughs> and puts it at the forefront because that seems to be now a fair a demand with fairly widespread support and i think secondly I don't like these two top things. I've got many. However, <laughs> um, I, I, I'd like to think not so much of the MDG agenda uh, in terms of its goals, but how does one um, build up the capacity for participation by people who are at the moment marginalized from decision making of at the local, national, and international level? So it's, it's really about means um, you know, to get what we want uh, acknowledged and recognized. Thank you very much indeed. I will resist the temptation to tell you mine. You <laughs> um, but oh thank no, you. go on, tell us. No, <laughs> <laughs> boring. <laughs> I'm sorry we ran over time. Thank you very much. I think the fact that we ran over time was an indication of the, the interest from you and the quality of the, of the conversation that we were having. So thank you very much. Thank you to Kevin and Richard who had to leave us, to all the panellists, to all of you for your questions. And I suspect and this conversation will run and run. Also, a big thank you to <laughs> Emma and Gina who have got us all here and, and organised this event for us. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.